Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mogorota Bakalaj Diverge, and I'm Director of Academic Programs at the Center for Jewish History. And I'm very happy to welcome you today to our virtual space. Center for Jewish History is a home for archival collections of five partner institutions Evo Institute for Jewish Research, Leobeck Institute, American Jewish Historical Society, Yeshiva University Museum, and American Sephardi Federation. <clears throat> Together, these collections create the second largest archive of the Jewish experience in the world. Over the last 20 years, the center has been also aspiring to be an intellectual home for exchanges and ideas, scholarship, creative practice, and groundbreaking encounters that are inspired and informed by these archival collections. Today, we end the 2020 spring semester of academic programs at the center with a very special conversation that stems out of and celebrates the newly released book, Rescue the Surviving Souls, the Great Jewish Refuge Crisis, Refugee Crisis and the 17th, uh, of the 17th century by Adam Teller. You can tell I'm very excited about that. Um, it's a special occasion to celebrate as the book already widely acclaimed, um, marks a new fundamental reference point to scholars of transnational early modern Jewish history, refugee experience, and complex consequences of displacement for the years to come. And it's also a special occasion for us at the center as we had an opportunity to witness Professor Teller working on this project as a national endowment for the humanities senior scholar. Since our move to the virtual space, our academic programs in the times of pandemic illuminated diverse aspects of living in turbulent times and places, focusing uh, mainly on micro perspectives, orphans, displaced people, individual thinkers and writers. History and literature that we were studying with our guest scholars received the timely context in the experience of the present. All the more we are glad that our today's discussion which raises more general questions. What are the long lasting consequences of refugee crisis? Uh, how can one attempt to and fully uh, grasp the transnational fate of those displaced in the chaos of war? Uh, what, can do, what can one do to alleviate the suffering? That all these gen more general questions will conclude our semester inspiring broader perspective grounded in Teller's uh, research and Jewish history and the times we live in. Let me very, very briefly introduce our speakers. I don't want to lose a second of the time. Uh, Adam Teller is a professor of history of Judaic studies at Brown University. He's the author of Money, Power and Influence, the Jews on the Rajivu Estates in 18th century Lithuania and the co-editor of Borders and Boundaries in the History of the Jews in Old Poland, among other of his publications. Jonathan Karp is Associate Professor and Undergraduate Director of Judaic Studies at Binghamton University, SUNY. His first book was uh, called uh, The Politics of Jewish Commerce, Economic Thought and Emancipation in Europe. And he's currently completing a study of cultural relations between American Jews and African Americans, entitled uh, Chosen Surrogates, How Blacks and Jews Transformed Modern American Culture. Before I leave the stage to our speakers, I would like to remind uh, you a few housekeeping things. First of all, you are welcome to write down your questions for the Q&A portion of our talk but please only use the Q&A function to do so. You're going to find it on the bottom of the screen. Do not use the chat. Because, second thing, uh, the chat functionality does not work among the attendees. So in other words, only I will be able to read your post, but not anyone else. And thirdly, our program is recorded and uh, will be available via the center's YouTube channel very soon. And now, without further ado, Gentlemen, the stage is yours. You need to unmute yourself. Yes. Thank you, Marco, that you can all hear me now. Okay, great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's an honor to discuss this wonderful book um, by Adam Teller, Rescue the Surviving Souls. Um, 
And I think Malko actually raised some uh, of the uh, fascinating, long-ranging, long-term issues that uh, that the book uh, elicits about uh, the situation of, of refugees in our own world. But uh, we're going to focus most of our conversation, which will be about 40 minutes, um, on the historical situation. I want to uh, give a, just a brief kind of uh, encapsulation of the book's subject matter. Uh, and then I'll turn to uh, asking uh, Adam uh, some questions. So this book is a study of Jewish refugees in the aftermath of the upheavals that occurred in mid 17th century Poland and Lithuania, dealing with their fates, including the economic, cultural, and psychological effects on them of these upheavals as traced in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth itself, in the Ottoman and Mediterranean realms, and in Central and Western Europe. It is the first comprehensive, one might say, transnational or even global study of this major episode in early modern Jewish history. So, Adam, congratulations on a magnificent achievement, um, uh, really a, a breakthrough work of scholarship. Um, I'm going to start off by asking you an impossible task, which is to, to give our audience a brief overview, just to kind of get the background uh, of some of the precipitating causes and the course of this multifaceted refugee crisis, which really sort of persisted from uh, 1648 till about 1667 or 68. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, um, thank you, Malgo, for that wonderful introduction. I am absolutely delighted to be here. And having spent a wonderful year researching the book uh, in 2012-13, it's a real pleasure that I can launch it through the center, even if we're doing it virtually. And thank you, John, uh, for joining me in this conversation. Um, okay, so where do, where do we start? Well, we start in Ukraine in 1648. Ukraine was at that stage annexed to the Kingdom of Poland, which was exploiting the very fertile land there in order to grow grain and make a profit. The issue was that Poland was a Catholic country and Ukraine was, uh, We'd say what we'd say Russian Orthodox, um, that Poland was a wealthy country and Ukraine was being occupied. And of course, that there were big cultural differences between Polish and Ukrainian culture, Polish culture being very dominant culture at that time and place. So what happened was when there was a, a quite a usual occurrence, which was an uprising of the army, the Cossack forces, Right, who wanted better paying conditions, within a very short time, that turned into this huge um, popular rebellion. And since the Jews were helping the Poles, particularly the Polish noblemen, control Ukraine and were acting as their agents on the ground, the Jews became one of the key targets of this uprising. Right? And it was an uprising of amazing force that took town after town, and that swept, that swept the whole region. So many, many Jews were killed. People argue about the numbers endlessly. But if you look at it in terms of percentage, it looks that about one third of the Jewish population was killed. And at least another third fled. They fled before the army. They were trying to find a place of safety. They knew that if they stayed and were caught, they'd be massacred. And so you have this first wave of refugees, which is internal to Eastern Europe. Some just stay in Ukraine, some go northwards to Lithuania, and some go westwards into Poland proper. Um, and it wasn't, that wasn't the end of the story, however, because as part of their rebellion, the Cossacks had, were in league with another group, the Tatars, uh, Muslim forces from the Crimean Peninsula. Now, the Tatars made their living from slaving. They'd been slaving in Eastern Europe for a over a century, uh, and they took thousands of um, slaves each year. But in 1648, they began taking Jews as slaves. And so you see thousands of Jews captured by these forces, 
and then shipped to Amsterdam, uh, shipped to Istanbul, where they were sold as slaves. They were put on the slave market and sold. That rebellion lasted about six years and cost Poland a lot um, in, in, in overcoming it. So much so that following it, two of Russia's neighbors, great powers of the day, Russia and Sweden, thought they'd be able to invade right, and, and cut off bits of Poland for themselves. Russia, of course, came from the east right, into Lithuania, which was then sort of uh, united with Poland. And they began also to take town after town. They targeted the Jews, the worst case being a huge massacre of Jews in Lublin, which already they'd got into Poland itself, in the fall of 1655. By this time, however, the Jews were better at running away. Once they knew that the Russians were coming, whole communities would organize together right, and try and find places of safety. Because in some cases, people went on their own. But it's quite remarkable you see communities organizing together. Where did they go? Some went north to the Baltic coast, and then they went, took ship, and they went to Hamburg or Amsterdam. And some just fled uh, westward into Poland. In fact, a lot of them got caught up in Lublin. Uh, so they, had twice, they were caught up twice in this fight. The other aspect of this, which is interesting, is that the Russian forces captured Jews and then took them into the Russian interior where they sold them as slaves. They sold them as, yes, captive slaves. And those Jews were transported sometimes out of Russia. So we know that in the 1650s, there is a colony of Polish Jews, or even more than one, of Polish Jews in Iran, right, where they've been sold and they're waiting to try and ransom themselves to get out and come home. The third problem, the third wave of refugees comes the next year, starting in 1655, where Sweden invades from the north uh, very successfully. It takes Great Poland, and then it takes Warsaw, and it takes the ancient capital of Krakow. It targets the Jews, but once again, the Jews are ahead of them. The Jews have organized and they, they're fleeing westwards into the Holy Roman Empire, into German lands. Um, but the situation got even worse when the Poles reorganized. They had a guerrilla war to drive the Swedes out. And in that war, the Jews were a major target. Hundreds were killed and many, many more fled westwards. So in these three wars, you can see sort of a number of different waves of refugees and what they like to call forced migrations of different kinds. Um, and altogether, my guess is there are probably about 30,000 involved in it. Now, in today's terms, that doesn't sound very much, but in 17th century terms, that is a very large, uh, very large population. Um, that's kind of, I think, the background to what we're talking about. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I, I want to begin um, by um, talking about uh, violence and trauma. Um, uh, the book isn't primarily about the uh, Khmelnytsky uprising uh, the anti-Jewish violence that occurs in, in, in that immediate uh, situation of the uprising or the subsequent invasions by Russia and Sweden. Uh, nevertheless, um, there, there is a considerable, as you've already suggested, amount of, uh, of, of, of violence that, that Jews suffer and longer term trauma. But it, the book is primarily a book about refugees, as we've already said, and, and therefore it is, in a sense, a book about flight. Um, and uh, there's a passage that, if you don't mind, I'd like to read a short passage on page 34, wh by, uh, which is written by uh, Natan Hanover, uh, who is one of the primary sources, perhaps the single major source for uh, the Khmelnytsky uh, events themselves, uprising and their effects on Jews themselves. Um, and I'm starting in the middle of the page. He, he describes a, a escape and he says, immediately indescribable panic and confusion seized the Jews. Everyone threw silver, gold, utensils, books, pillows, and bed covers from their carts so they could get away more quickly. The field was cluttered with gold, silver, and clothes, but no Jew stopped to take them. Some left everything behind, including the horse and cart, and fled for their lives into the woods with their wives and children. Many women and men who had taken their children by the hand let go of them in the panic. 
there's so much uh, that is um, brought to light or suggested in that brief uh, statement. Um, I know this wasn't the universal experience. You've already said that uh, there were Jewish communities that were better prepared for the crisis and were able to plan, and this is a description of, of panic and flight. But perhaps you can elaborate on what is suggested there. So what we tend to think about when we think about the uprising is the number of dead and the violence that kills people. And of course, that's a very significant topic. I'm not I'm running it down in any way. But I was interested in the survivors. I was interested in the people who ran away. And what they took with them when they ran away was not their possessions. But as you can see here, they had to leave their possessions behind in one way or another. What they took with them was their experiences. And being a refugee is, among other things, dealing with the experience of flight which can be horrifying and terrible and traumatic. Um, I, have other, I have another text, if you'll allow me to read a, another text about trauma um, from one of the later flights. And it reads as follows. I remained alone, languishing with a broken leg, lame and crippled, when God destroyed the Polish and Lithuanian communities. Everything I valued was taken from me, all my wealth and possessions, my family, two little girls murdered as martyrs, and the holy books I had written. In fear, I thought, I had been cut off from the land of the living, for I had been tossed into the open road, defiled and filthy, rolling in the blood of murdered martyrs who had given up their souls to die. I was starving and so thirsty that my tongue stuck to my palate. Naked I was and barefoot, even bare buttocks. When was that written, Adam? Um, that was written, it was written, well, it was written in about 1670, and it happened in about 1655. And I think that's important. These are the experiences that the refugees took with them. They are traumatized by this. When I talk about trauma, I'm not talking about literary trauma or cultural trauma. I'm talking about psychological trauma. Um, not that we can, of course, do any diagnosis. We can't diagnose the, the uh, PTSD. That can't be done, but um, these people are clearly traumatized. And if we want to understand refugees and refugee crisis, we have to understand trauma. And in doing that, we have to understand the individual. It's so easy to look at the numbers. I'm looking at 30,000 today. We begin looking at hundreds of thousands or millions of refugees. But that is to miss, I think, a crucial point. Each of those hundreds of thousands is a person with experiences. And if we want to understand what's going on, we can't avoid looking at their experience. So that's what I did. I tried to understand how trauma worked, what it meant for the people, not just while they were fleeing, but while they were reconstructing their lives. Um, and I, I think dealing with trauma is um, a key point, not just in this period of Jewish history, but in Jewish history in general. right? From time to time in Jewish history, the Jews suffer various setbacks, right? massacres, expulsions, and so on. Um, and this is always, always studied, and we know exactly when these happened. But what we don't know is what the long-term consequences of these were. And what we don't know is how it was that the Jews managed to recover time after time after time. So one of the pieces of research I did here was to try to see how Polish Jews in Poland actually recovered from trauma. Um, and I found a number of interesting ways that common to Jewish culture, but when you think of it in terms of trauma, show a really intuitive understanding of what to do. Um, so for example, um, they set up a special day of memory right, on the 20th of Sivan. Right, you would go into synagogue, They'd say special prayers, right, which contained kind of stylized descriptions of what happened. It was a moment for communities to come together, to embrace the traumatized survivors and allow them to include their experiences in the normal flow of life. That's a key way of getting over trauma, trying to reintegrate it into life. And the Jews did it quite naturally. Another interesting thing they did was to deal with the problem of vengeance. Vengeance is a very negative feeling. Um, 
but the Jews in Poland sublimated it in two important ways. In the prayers, they suggested that the vengeance for what was done to them was in God's hands, and he would visit it on the, on the evil right, at the end of time, the day of, uh, the day of judgment. On the other hand, when they, they made a great effort to take murderers to court, they, they sued them, right? They took them to court. Um, and those cases were also called vengeance, nikama. And so what the Jews are doing is taking this sense of we need vengeance and sublimating it in much more positive ways, whether it's spiritual or legal. Um, and that, I think, is one of the key ways in which Polish Jews were able to overcome the terrible trauma that they suffered. Um, like and that's part up, of the story I'm telling. I'd like to pick up on a couple of the points that you just made. First, I, I think that many in the audience may be surprised to know that Polish Jews were able at times to um, seek retribution through legal means against non-Jews in Polish courts. You describe that. Um, uh, and so I don't know how, how frequent it was, but it was available at times. Um, a second uh, point that you make is that, um, that the effort to memorialize, to commemorate, was always in tension with traditional liturgical practices of Ashkenazi Jews. So there was an effort, for instance, to persuade famous Rabbi Yom Tov Lipman Heller to uh, produce or write a, a lamentation that would memorialize these events. And initially, if I recall the story correctly, he um, sort of assimilated them into um, what, what might, one might say were, were standard uh, liturgies uh, that went back to the medieval crusade uh, persecutions. But the communities insisted that he say something specific about their experience and not just generic suffering. Uh, so so th this episode clearly um, was not simply um, assigned to uh, the normal course of events that Jews suffer and God visits uh, his, uh, his, his uh, retribution on his people, but he will redeem them. This is part of the theology. But, 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 but there was a desire to have their experiences affirmed in a way and recognized. Is that correct? That's right. What you see is they want both. They want to eat their cake and have it. Right? They're very interested in having their experience um, put into the line of Jewish suffering going back to the medieval period and blood libels and so on. They want, they want to be part of that because that puts them in relationship with God. As you said, God and his people and retribution and, and uh, um, uh, redemption and so on. And they definitely want that because that's very reassuring. Right? It hasn't been for nothing. This is, has meaning. On the other hand, these people are aware that what's happened to them is something special and unique to them, and they're not prepared to give up on that, to sublimate that entirely. And once again, I think it is exactly to do with this question of trauma. It's by remembering the specifics, right, that you can work through them. They wanted, they needed to do that. And when the rabbi right, wrote this very bland, you know, very bland generic piece, um, they just went back to him and said, you know, we're sorry, we don't accept this. You have to write a proper one, right? And he didn't want to. He, he tried to weasel out of it a little bit. In the end, he had to give in. There must have been a lot of pressure on the ground for him to do it. Um, there's, go on. there's one other uh, aspect of this that I thought was fascinating, which is um, what we today might think of as survivor guilt. Um, because I committed these personal sins, God uh, wreaked vengeance on the entire Jewish community. Uh, I must repent, uh, but but it's beyond uh, my capacity to repent for this uh, terrible. But you, but you, you suggest that this uh, what we might call survivor guilt and this this consciousness of sin actually had potentially a positive component to it. That it was an instrument of of agency in a way psychologically. Am I am I understanding that correctly? 
Well, in some senses, um, when somebody imagines that it is his or her sin that has caused the terrible crisis and caused the suffering, they psychologically transform themselves from being a poor victim swept up in events bigger than them and suffering, terrible suffering, and all of a sudden they become central actors in the drama. Right? And that is psychologically a very important moment. Right? As, because, as I said, these people are all, in one way or another, struggling with their trauma, with their loss of self, and um, this is one way in which they could they could get it back. And you see it in all kinds of different different ways. People, um, sexual sins that have been committed suddenly become the cause of this violence. Um, tavern keepers who fail to keep Shabbat properly suddenly become the reason that this all happened. Um, but it's all part of the same desire not to be a victim. They didn't want to be a victim. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll, we'll push on because there's so much to talk about in so little time, but um, you already referred to the Tatars uh, capturing large numbers of, of refugees and um, transporting them mostly to Istanbul, um, where they would be put on the slave market. Um, and a lot of, uh, of of these chapters uh, dealing with the with with captivity deal with the efforts of the communities in Istanbul and elsewhere in the Ottoman and Sephardi Mediterranean worlds to redeem these captives to free them um, and fulfill the mitzvah of pidyon shvuim um, and and what struck me in reading it was that the the problem the numbers uh, although we don't have a firm grasp of numbers they were certainly in the thousands uh, of of uh, those who were brought to the slave market uh, to be either sold to a master or redeemed uh, the community of Istanbul in particular but also uh, the other communities to which Istanbul appealed made remarkable, almost superhuman efforts, it seemed to me, to, to redeem these Jews, these Polish Jews, these Lithuanian Jews. Um, and um, so that raises a number of questions. Um, first of all, why was this particular mitzvah so monumental um, to them? Second, um, how did they actually go about trying to raise the the funds, if you can explain it, uh, encapsulate it fairly briefly, to, to accomplish this? And then third, to what extent were they actually successful in their efforts? Okay. Well, first of all, Pidyon Shuim, uh, ransoming captives, is a major commandment, the major mitzvah, and that is um, codified by Maimonides, by the Rambam who says it's even more important than the mitzvah of communal charity. He was living in medieval Egypt. He himself was deeply engaged in redeeming captives. Um, and so it, it actually takes a central importance. It is preserving the community because if you're sold as a slave or as a captive, um, then there's a good chance you'll be forced to convert and leave the Jewish uh, community. And this has to be stopped at all costs. It's self preservation. Um, in the actual environment we're talking about, the Eastern Mediterranean, so between Italy and Turkey, what we'd say today, um, Pidyon Shuim was already a major issue because it was a part of the, of the Mediterranean that was infested with pirates who would capture ships and people on ships, right, and sell them for slaves. It's a different kind of slavery from what we're used to. It's called captive slavery, right? So put, these people are, captive, are captured and made to work, but the goal is not to exploit their labor you know, until they die, but to exploit their labor until they are redeemed. So it's a different, slightly different kind of slavery than what we're used to in seeing uh, here in America. Um, the issue was 
that to ransom a captive cost about a month's wages for a skilled craftsman. It's a huge amount of money. Um, and, if, and if you have a, a, this enormous wave of thousands of Jews on the market, in order to ransom them, in order to keep this mitzvah, um, you're going to need huge amounts of money. And Istanbul found itself in an incredible crisis, really from the get-go, right? And is writing desperately to all kinds. He's writing to Venice, which is a major community. It writes to some communities in Poland. Um, it gets in contact with Karaite communities, right? Trying to raise money. More than that, we know that the women of Istanbul actually sold their jewelry in order to raise money, in order to ransom the Jews. And what's remarkable is, as you said, um, all of those Jews, right, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Venice, um, are Sephardi Jews. And there is a big cultural, cultural gap between them and the Ashkenazi Jews. They don't speak the same language. They don't dress the same way. Um, they have different customs, religious customs. I mean, there's a lot in common, but they are differentiated. And uh, the Sephardi Jews could well have said, yes, there is a mitzvah of Pidyon Shuim, but that belongs to the Ashkenazi, an Ashkenazic problem, and we're not interested. But they didn't. This is one of the, I think, the first times that that wall is broken down. And they say, no, these are our brothers, and we are responsible for them. And so what comes into play is an astonishing philanthropic network that had been developed to deal with the issue of the pirates, which was not unimportant, but relatively minor compared to the slaves, in which communities, Sephardic communities across the Eastern Mediterranean, so you from Damascus, Cairo, um, uh, uh, um, Salonika, Venice, Istanbul, right, they are all in contact and they're all part of a philanthropic network that raises money in order to ransom slaves, ransom captive slaves. Um, and so this network isn't created in 1648, but it sort of suddenly takes on this enormous importance because of the, the dimensions of the crisis it has to deal with. And so um, what's created a much closer contact between these Sephardi communities in this attempt to save the Ashkenazi Jews who are being put on, uh, put on the market. This, uh, the Jews of Istanbul, who are very soon out of money, send their own emissary, a man called David Carcassoni. He goes to Venice, right, and then he gets sent around the network to raise money. So it's not just Italy, he gets to Hamburg, he gets to Amsterdam, trying to raise money um, with not terribly great success, but he does that. Uh, and so this network sort of swings into action in a very significant way. And that's going to have long-term repercussions, I think. Well, I'd like to pick up on that because there were times when I got the sense that the problem was so overwhelming and so multifaceted because they're not just dealing with um, ransoming captives in Istanbul, but they're also dealing with individuals who are appealing for their help. They're dealing with communities in Poland and Lithuania who are trying to rebuild and who are appealing for their help. The calls for assistance are coming from every direction. Um, and so sometimes I got the impression that it was beyond their capacity to, to such an extent to deal with that it led to a fragmentation of the philanthropic network. But at other times I got the sense that we see here that the initial building blocks, perhaps, of a, of a sort of successful internationalization of, of Jewish philanthropy with, with possible long-term implications. Um, can you, can you uh, tell us where you fall on that spectrum? Okay. Um, so first of all, you're right. That the, the demands on this philanthropic system were huge, right? Not just, as you said, not just the slaves, there are communities that have been destroyed that are asking for money to rebuild. Um, and there are individuals, people traveling around, right? they've either fled, they're either actual refugees, or they're trying to raise money to ransom their own family members who are being held in Istanbul. And there isn't enough money to go around. And that's absolutely clear, right? Um, 
most, almost none of these people are actually turned away entirely. Um, but very often the amounts given to them are very small and not very helpful, which meant that raising money could be a very tiresome business if you were doing it yourself. You had to go around from place to place, take a long time getting a small amount of money in each place. Um, I don't think that this caused a fragmentation of the system. There is a, there's a financial overload, which means, as I say, that there's a lot of disappointment in what, you know, the, the amounts being raised. But I don't think the system actually, actually disintegrates, quite the reverse. I'm really impressed with the way it manages to hold together because you don't see Polish Jews being turned away. I don't have records. Um, no, I don't have records of any place yes. where, right. they, where, where they turn up and they're not given anything. Um, the interesting question is what happened in Istanbul itself? I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Uh, because they didn't raise a huge amount of money Right in, in Europe, when the, with their with their emissary, and they had more emissaries than just one, they didn't raise a huge amount of money. They had to do it themselves, and I just don't know where that money came from. But this doesn't lead to the significant augmentation of the Ashkenazic community in Istanbul, um, uh, be, because uh, because these Ashkenazim uh, either uh, can't can't be redeemed; they are redeemed uh, for the most part, or can't go home, which is another issue that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but, but in a sense, um, the Istanbul community by hook or by crook does seem to be able to address this. We just can't quite figure out uh, all of the nuts and bolts of how it achieves that remarkable. Uh, yeah, I have, I have a source written by a non-Jewish French observer in Istanbul in the, in the late 60s. And he writes, absolutely. I mean, he knew the Jewish community. He was very interested in the Sabathian Messianic movement. He, he knew Jews. And he writes absolutely clearly that the Jews ransomed everybody. Right? So we, it's, not, you know, it's not that they didn't, they did. Right? We don't have many records of Jews who've been sold as slaves and converted to Islam wanting to come back again, right? which is a, a halakhic issue that has to be dealt with. We don't have those things. So it seems likely, I, got, I can't say 100%, but it seems likely to me that they were all ransomed. And I have really no idea how. It's one of the frustrations of working in earlier periods. Right? You know, the source brace is fragmented. You have to work with what there is, not what you want there to be. And there just isn't the data. Well, um, the, the point that um, the, the mitzvah was to ransom them, but not necessarily to right. uh, facilitate their return. And, and the problem of return, which I alluded to a moment ago, was, was a major problem. And this is very far away. This is a great distance um, and a dangerous uh, journey back to Poland, Lithuania. And meanwhile, the conflict is in some ways still going on for a couple of decades. Um, so the choice remained as to, as to whether to, to stay in the Ottoman Eastern Mediterranean realm or to, to try to get back. Um, right. This choice was perhaps particularly acute for women. And I think you suggest that women may have been the majority of captives because the Tatars preferred to uh, take women. Uh, so so a, a range of problems which you confront um, are, arise from that. One is, of course, the question of, of women who can't get back to their husbands, whose husbands may have assumed that they converted or perished, uh, who want to remarry or have remarried. And so this this question of divorce and remarriage is an issue. And the question of starting a new life uh, in this world, which is foreign to them, also arises. I know it's a big uh, topic, but perhaps you could say a few words about right. it. I'll try to do this briefly. So first of all, as far as the men are concerned, what you tend to see is that they work their passage. So once they're redeemed, and as you say, they're, after that, they're, you know, they're not special. They, they, the Mishra Pidjon Shroom doesn't uh, relate to them. But they work, and we have records of Polish Jews working in Istanbul, raising the money until they have enough, and then they disappear and go home. Um, and we do know that, um, as you said, that the, the Ashkenazic communities, they don't grow dramatically um, in the face of this. In fact, they don't grow at all. And so it seems very likely that the Jews, the male Jews went home. The female Jews, that's a whole different issue. Um, because even if they got home, and it's a, it's, you know, if that journey is dangerous for men, right, it's you know, doubly, triply, quadruply dangerous for women. 
right, who are always targeted um, more than the men, whether it's actually in the uprising itself, they're more targeted, they are more valuable as slaves, and just traveling, they are easier targets for criminals. So they have less interest in going back. And I say, even if they get back, their, rab their husband is likely to say, well, I don't know, did you sleep with your captors or not? Did, right? And even if she's forced to sleep with them, right, she is then um, forbidden to her husband, or he can, um, he can divorce her. Uh, and that's an enormous amount of suspicion. And it may well have suited the women not to go back and, and, and try to start a new life. On one condition, and that was that they could get positive proof, either that their husband was still alive and would divorce them, or that he was dead and there were witnesses to his death. Um, if they could get that, then they were free to start a new life where they were. Um, if they couldn't, they were in another terrible situation of what is called an aguna, um, which is a woman who can't prove that her husband is dead, and so she can't get divorced, and she isn't free to remarry. She remains in this limbo, right, on the margins of society, right, for the rest of her life. Um, and that's another major issue during this time, how these women deal with that problem. And the interesting things, women got actually quite active. So there's a group of women in Cairo. Yes. Who's, uh, you know, they want to get divorced from their husband. So they hire a man and they, he goes back to Eastern Europe. He travels around and gets divorce papers from their husbands and comes back again. Right. And then they take it to the court and the rabbi has all kinds of questions. But these women have organized themselves, raised enough money and sent a representative back to get the documents. In other cases, we know that there was an information network. Women would collect information, testimonies about events in Eastern Europe. They would have them um, written down, memorialized in the courts. And then these could serve as depositions for other women who needed proof about their husbands. Um, and, and that flow of information is really quite interesting. Um, but once again, it's a sign that I mean, the women are in an awful situation. It's much, much worse than the men's situation. But they are doing what they can to be active in order to relieve the suffering that they're suffering. And I think one of the uh, um, laudable characteristics of, of, of your book is that you, th you, you thread the story of women and their special challenges and experiences throughout. It's not that you devote a single chapter or a section just to women, but, your, but their story uh, and experience is present uh, in, in, in many of the chapters. Um, I think it's time we, we turn to the last uh, sort of theater of operations. I think we have about 10 minutes. Um, and uh, the last part uh, of the book centers on the refugee experience in Central Europe, uh, mainly in the German lands in the Holy Roman Empire. And, and here we find a related theme to that of the Sephardi Ashkenazi relationship that, that is explored uh, earlier on. Uh, it's analogous. It's the complex and sometimes tense relationship between Polish refugees and uh, their German uh, Ashkenazi uh, co-religionists. Um, and we see this tension even prior to 1648 uh, with what, and you don't use this word, but I decided I would use it. Uh, you probably uh, would reject it, but the Polonization of Judaism in Central Europe uh, through the Shulchan Aruch and, uh, and, and through the, um, the movement of, of rabbis and teachers into Central Europe in the early, earlier part of the 17th century. Um, so there's already a kind of um, culture clash. Uh, and this is exacerbated by the influx of refugees that come in the 1650s. You have a, a marvelous Yiddish source, uh, Die Beschreibung von Ashkenaz und Polak, that encapsulates some of this phenomenon. So perhaps you could discuss it and, and what, it, what it taught you. Okay. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed doing when I was writing this book was I discovered a wealth of material about Ashkenazi culture 
that um, has been written down in bibliographies and described that has not been used by historians. There are, it's, a, it's a really significant amount of sources in Yiddish. Unfortunately, it's old Yiddish, which is a very, very difficult to read um, and understand. And um, I was very lucky to have a help from experts to do it because I was struggling. Um, but what you do get is a sense of the Ashkenazi street, right? what's happening on the ground, what people are thinking, ordinary people. Most of the books are written by educated people. Uh, Yiddish sources are also, if not written by women, read by women. And so it's also an issue of gender. Anyway, this source that I discovered, that is um, the description of the Polish and the German Jew, is actually about the meeting of a Jewish refugee from Poland right, and a German Jewish house, householder. Right? And it describes it as a cat and mouse game. Right? The Polish Jew wants help and the German Jew doesn't want to give it to him, right? And they, they're suspicious of each other, right? Um, the German Jew sees the Pole's clothes and his hat and his long beard is uncouth, whereas the Polish Jew sees the German's beard, you know, his little goatee type beard as being not Jewish. Um, and so it's a kind of satirical look at those tensions that develop. Now, the tensions were real. I mean, satire doesn't work unless there's something to be satirized. Um, what had happened was that German Jewry in the previous period, up till 1648, had been going through from one of the worst periods in its existence. Um, in the previous century, there'd been a number of expulsions, or previous two centuries. Um, so the numbers weren't great. The major communities, there were only two or three left. Um, and to add on to that, They'd just gone through the Thirty Years' War, which ended in 1648. Um, and there's a very poor community. And all of a sudden, you know, hundreds of Jews start turning up and demanding help. Uh, Polish Jews felt entitled. Uh, before 1648, they'd been the center of the Ashkenazi world. It was the biggest community, the wealthiest community. The great yeshivas were there. It had helped German Jewry during the Thirty Years' War. It had given them money, taken the children in. Um, so they came in, 16, in the 1650s and said, well, here we are, we helped you, you help us. Right? And the German Jews were you know, horrified by this, we don't want to help you, and we haven't got the money to help you, and who the, what else do you think you are, right? You know, German Jews had a sense of who they were. And, and so this tension, did, and it actually is tangible, and you see it in a lot of sources. Right? The, the feeling amongst the German Jews that the Polish Jews are somehow untrustworthy, criminal um, and a really bad group of people. Um, while I say that the, the Polish Jews um, look down on the German Jews as ignoramuses and um, uncultured. What is, how does this play out? What's important? It's that what you see beginning in 1648 with this meeting is a sense of identity on both sides, both sides define themselves in opposition to the other side. I am a German, I'm a Polish Jew because I'm not a German Jew. And even more, I am a German Jew because I'm not a Polish Jew, right? And so that tension and mistrust becomes a stereotype, which you see in the Bashraib, you see in the, the, the mm -hmm. poem I was talking about. And that sort of solidifies into social attitudes. So that this meeting of German and Polish Jews is the beginning of the development of concepts that we see later in the 19th and 20th century of the Ostjuda, the Eastern European Jew as, as being um, the, the wrong kind of Jew, not the right kind of Jew. We're the right kind of Jew. Um, and so this is, I think, one of the long-term consequences that that tension is brought to the surface, right? And it solidifies, and it becomes part of the creation of what we know today as German Jewry. That's just to add on one last point, and that is demographics. Yeah. German Jewry was a small group. As the refugees came, and then other Jews came in their wake, it gave them a demographic boost. Um, and so German Jewry actually grew physically because of the influx of the Polish Jews, right, who assimilated within a generation or two, and then themselves became German Jews. Sorry, John. 
you also no, you also uh, make the point that uh, with their limited resources, the German Jews often made every uh, effort to help uh, the Polish uh, refugees. Oh, absolutely. And, and this is also a theme that runs through into the 20th century, um, uh, where there is a sense of uh, on the part of the East European Jew as being looked down upon and and treated uh, held at arm's length by the German Jew, and there is a sense of the uh, German Jew of uh, noblesse oblige and providing uh, significant resources. Uh, so there's a mutuality of uh, benefits, but there's also a crystallization of this stereotype as you describe it. Like I said, the Polish Jews were generally not turned away. There yes. could be tensions, right? There could be anger, all kinds of things could happen. But on the whole, right, th these Polish Jews were looked after, just not as well as they wanted to be. Well, that's true for all of us, I suppose. Isn't it? But um, I think we'll conclude now. I just want to ask you a, a, a last set of questions, and, and you've already referred to longer term uh, consequences. Uh, first, in your um, uh, conclusion, you, you make a distinction um, between um, the, the crisis of the uh, uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in the mid-17th century, the Khmelnytsky uprising, um, as a, a turning point in Jewish history, which some, um, some, have, uh, some historians have stressed. Um, and and you, you're not comfortable with that, with that concept, even though you, you do see some longer-term implications. Let me just throw this at you. Um, is there a case to be made that, uh, in a way, that the transformation wrought by the crisis was, was less real than apparent? And, and what I mean is, uh, well, there's a wonderful quote I actually have here, uh, Isaac Bashevis Singer's uh, Satan and Gore, which describes, which opens with a description, I think, drawn from Hanover of the, of the massacres. Uh, but then quickly moves on to talk about the aftermath. And he says, um, it is the way of the world that in time, everything reverts to what it has been. Um, and, and we do see that in a sense um, in taking place in Poland, Lithuania, um, where there is a, a demographic recovery. In fact, uh, over the long term, a significant expansion. There is an economic recovery. Uh, in some ways, as you describe, the Polish nobility um, uh, welcome the Jews back uh, with, uh, if not open arms, then with uh, greater privileges uh, than before. Um, in some ways, the uh, non-Jewish uh, town's population uh, in some parts has been decimated. And so th that gap is, is filled even more so by, by Jews. So um, uh, could we possibly say that, that the, the change that took place as dramatic and, and uh, traumatic as it was, uh, was, was in a sense more, more apparent than real um, because the course of, of at least Polish Jewish history um, continued apace and even intensified along lines that uh, were evident even before 1648. Okay. It's a complex question. Um, I don't think that we're looking at something that is just apparent rather than real. In the book, I try to distinguish between a turning point, which is a concept historians love, right? I've identified something, right? There's things that led up to it, and afterwards everything is new because what I'm talking about changes the world. History doesn't work like that. It just doesn't, right? What happens usually is that things happen, um, and as you move beyond the crisis, there's much continuity and a certain amount of change. And the change is quite often predicated on what had come before as well. So it's not a 90 degree, so I'm gonna turn right and move in a different direction, it's a 30 degree. But a 30 degree deviation, as it goes on, becomes greater and greater. Um, and so I, what I saw in this, in this phenomenon was exactly that. What came before? I mean, um, as you say, the Jews had their relationship with the noblemen. There were ransoming efforts before um, um, 1648. 
and I mean, Poland Jews and German Jews have been meeting on and off for a century and a half at least. So you could say, if you just sort of take a very broad view, and scholars have done this, you take a bird's eye view, well, nothing really changed, you know, a few people ran away and that's the end of the story. It's not that. What happened was that the experience of these people and the experience of the people that were helped, that helped them, right. came together to create new conditions. It's not a transformation. You're right, there is a lot of continuity. But what it is, is um, uh, reshaping. Right? All the, it's like a kaleidoscope. All the bits of the kaleidoscope are there, but you have to turn it to get the picture that you get. Right? And that's what happened here. And I mean, you talk about the Polish Jews recovering. That wasn't obvious. I mean, today we think it's obvious, right? Because by the time you get to the end of the 17th century, the, the Polish Jews are, as I wrote in my first book, the Polish Jews are flourishing and they're, and they're doing extremely well. But that's not obvious. I mean, that wasn't, uh, it didn't have to be that way. they would just gone through 20 years, right? Of murder, mayhem and flight. It was their way of dealing with that experience that allowed them to reshape their communities, right? And so that when economic opportunities did crop up in the later period, they could take advantage of them. And it's the same in the Mediterranean, right? Those connections that are created, right? So they were there before, but they take on a kind of immediacy and an urgency and a strength, um, which means that they continue to exist. And I have a chapter, in one of the chapters of the book, I talk about the spread of the Sabathian movement, the false messianic movement around Shabbat Sri. And what's really interesting is, to a very great extent, it spreads along the same lines yeah. of the philanthropic networks that I was discovering. Right? So, so something did change. It's just not, it wasn't a different world the day after. It was a different world a century after. And, but the change began and its roots are in 1648 and the experience of the refugees. Well, thank you very much. It's been a, a marvelous conversation and I think we should now uh, open it up to the audience. So I'll turn the hosting back to Malga. John, thank you very much. A great, really great conversation. My pleasure. Thank you for both very much. Uh, I, it looks like it was a prophecy when I said that your conversation is going to initiate a reflection because we um, we have a lot of reflection I can feel the density of one but not a lot of question at least not of not yet uh, so please uh, your attendees you're welcome to pose your questions uh, via the Q&A um, section so I'm going to read them all chronologically uh, this is also the information for the attendees. Uh, please be patient. I will definitely read all the questions. So Adam, question number one, I will merge because it really is a two-part question. Uh, did the Jews get any compensation through the courts? And even if they did not get financial compensation, did the court strongly rebuke or impose some sort of penalty on the perpetrators? Yeah. Are you going to answer it or are you going to give me them all? No, no, I will, I will read one by one. Yes, well, yes, the Jews could rely on the courts um, to get, comp I mean, if they were accusing somebody of stealing their property while they were away uh, and they could persuade the court this is what happened, then they would get compensation for what happened. If there'd been a case of murder and you can prove murder, then yes, there are fines, you know, there's a imprisonment and fines and whatever. The court system was not weighted against the Jews. The Jews in Poland are so integrated into society that they make use of the court system. They choose the right jurisdiction and they know how to work the system. And so, yes, the courts do come, you know, not every time, of course, but they, you know, they can rely on the courts um, to, to make things better. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from uh, Nancy Sinkov, uh, Adam Mazalto. Uh, can you tell us more about your sources and the incredible slow thing you did? Ah, wow. Okay, um, sources. But one of the problems, in fact, one of the pleasures of writing this book is that I didn't have a, a, sort of a set of sources. Normally a historian identifies a set of sources, you get down, you study it, 
right? And that's your work and that's your book. I didn't have that. What happened was I started doing a little project about ransoming and I suddenly realized that there's more material here than meets the eye. And, and, and it started leading me from source to source. Very often they're small sources, autobiographical vignettes, four or five lines in the introduction to a book. But that one leads on to the other and it becomes historical detective work, which is enormous fun, just very slow and, you know, it takes a long time. It took me 10 years to write the book. Um, but it's a lot of fun, right? And, and then you discover that there are materials written by non-Jews. And then I discovered the Yiddish sources. Um, I don't have great archival sources because there was no body that dealt with it, right? Archival sources are left by a body, a body's record. There was no body Jewish or non-Jewish that dealt with it. So it really is a, a mosaic of little pieces that I discovered over 10 years and that I have stuck them together, right? To make, to make the book as it was. Um, so, I mean, I'm, the autobiographical vignettes are incredible because they're first-hand retellings of what happened. I mean, for all the problems that first-hand retellings have, they are, there are so many of them. It's quite remarkable how many are left, dozens, if not hundreds, are, are there to be found. Um, and I, I sort of got a sense, I could look in the bibliography and say, you know what, this is a book that's going to have one in it. Right? And, then, and then I would go and check. And, it, and the other thing was wonderful about this was that I, I could get all the material on my computer. If I'd written this book 20 years ago, I would still be traveling around Europe and, the, you know, and looking for libraries where there's the one copy of one book. When I was doing this piece of research, I just sat in front of the computer. I wanted a book, click, there it is. Astonishing. I mean, really astonishing. It's at that part of the, the new world in which we do live. Um, so that, one of the other things that also I, I like very much working in, in the hidden in the center, I was using the YIVO store, the sources from YIVO, which is one of the partners there. And the, and the Dubnov connection, Dubnov was a great uh, Jewish historian. Well, Dubnov had a whole network of people who would send him material. You know, they would look around their communities and they find document or they find a reference and they write it down and send it to Dubnov. And all that material is, is saved in the Dubnov archive. So I went to the Dubnov archive and found this material. And it was like I had my own team of researchers, right? Going through the destroyed communities of Eastern Europe, finding me materials. It was an astonishing, not transnational, it's transchronological feeling, right? That people living before the Holocaust were sending me material that I could write, used to write the book. It is fascinating indeed. Uh, could Adam talk about the rise of uh, the Mohikim uh, in the process of survival guilt? Rise of? Uh, Mochichim. Ah, Mochichim. Um, rise of Mochichim. I'm not sure I talk about a rise of Mochichim, but they, they did play. I mean, there's this question that troubles Polish Jews, right? Who's responsible for that? Why did this happen? Right? Um, and as I said, a lot of people psychologically try to make themselves the victim. But people slightly higher up, in the spiritual hierarchy, we're trying to put together a sort of more theological approach. Um, and you do see amongst preachers and mochichim uh, attempts to say who's responsible. Um, but what's interesting is that they can't agree on it. Right? You have some, I mean, it's a big problem um, um, ascribing responsibility to the survivors, even though they're guilty as they feel, but if you ascribe to them guilt, then you are making them responsible for what happened to their loved ones, and that is not acceptable. Um, and so they had to find ways of expressing this. And um, I think Hanover says, and it's, he didn't make it up, he's quoting from the sources, says, um, we are punished, the, 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 the righteous in the generation are punished for the sins of the wicked. So, you know, we are righteous and, and somebody wicked did it. And it, other, others were try, did try to ascribe guilt. As I said, there was this question of um, keeping Shabbat. Did the Jews keep Shabbat properly? There was the question of um, connection between Jews and non-Jews in the villages. All kinds of issues arose that some, some of the preachers tried to um, ascribe to Polish Jews. But in fact, that wasn't successful. Um, they couldn't come to any agreement. 
So you have various um, sermons which include this stuff, but there's no agreement. The agreement comes, I think, um, in what we talked about the day of mem the day of memorialization. That's what brought the Jews together, um, and that is not that is perhaps less theological. I mean, it's a theological element than it is social. It's in the public sphere. Right, the day of memorial, that's something people can unite around. And they can unite around this tension between um, it happened to us and it's part of a long-term suffering of the Jews. Interestingly, some um, rabbis tried to write new verses for Maus Tzor, the, the hymn we sing on Hanukkah, which each verse of which talks about you know, the sufferings of the Jews. And they wanted to add a new one for 1648, right, what we suffered. That, that didn't work either. Um, but the memorialization effort, that was what brought the Jews together. And the attempts to ascribe guilt um, were not successful. I feel like I'm reading the missing chapter of uh, Yerushalmi's Zachor uh, when listening to you. Um, next question. Uh, do those who express the feeling that they were the cause of the catastrophe vow to themselves or in a public way uh, to change their behavior? Are there major changes in the community because of rep uh, repentance behavior after the ca catastrophe? The people who take it upon themselves are generally looking for punishment. Uh, then you know they do want to change, but they want to be punished. Um, they want it coming from outside. I think they want that validation. There's, there's no the internal validation isn't strong. They want the external validation. Um, so I think there's less of that. So can you read the question again? Because I've missed a part of it. Sure, uh, I already moved it. So uh, do those who express the feeling that they were the cause of the catastrophe vow to themselves or in a public way to change their behavior? Are there major changes in the community because of repentance behavior after the catastrophe? Not directly. What happens, and it, it, one of the com 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 complicating factors in this research is while this is going on, you have the outburst of the messianic movement around Shabbatai Tzvi. And it's in the wake of that, which comes straight on the heels of 1648, more or less, that you do see this great wave of repentance among Jews, right? and an interest in Kabbalah. And it's, um, and it's really hard to distinguish between whether that's survivor guilt, right? people who are you know, trying to work through what had happened in 1648, or whether this is really part of the messianic um, up a revival and then um, disappointment. Shabtai Tzvi was well aware of what happened in 1648. He talks about it. And he, he ascribes parts of his messianism to it. Um, even more interestingly, he actually married uh, a refugee, a Polish Jewish refugee, um, a French woman called Sarah. I, I think it's Sarah, the daughter of Mayer, but I can't remember now. Man. She, she ends up on, on the margins of society in Livorno, which is a port city in Italy. He hears about her, brings her to Cairo and marries her. So he's well aware of 1648, and for him, 1648 is really meaningful. Um, so I, I can't distinguish, I mean, there is this wave of, of, of um, repentance in the later 17th century, but I can't put my finger exactly on which of those two or what the balance between those two uh, in creating it. Maybe I could jump in for just one second, because one of the key components that we didn't have time to talk about, but we've alluded to a couple of times, is the relationship between 1648 and, and the Sabbatean movement. Um, and, and famously, Gershom Sholem had rejected uh, this connection as really causative, because, precisely because he saw it as a, essentially a local event. What your book shows is that it's uh, the farthest thing from a local event, that its repercussions are uh, felt throughout the Jewish world. So uh, perhaps you could just say a word about your intervention in that longstanding debate. Okay, um, so what I, what I did um, was to look at the, 
the, the roots, the connections, the networking that was created around 1648. And then I brought into play something we haven't talked about, which is another complicating factor. There is a second philanthropic network working in parallel, which is the network that supported the Jews in the land of Israel. Um, and those two networks were in tension. And so um, what I discovered was that Jewish Kabbalists, the, the Jews of Istanbul sent Polish Jews to raise, the Jews of the land of Israel sent Polish Jews to raise money for the land of Israel, which was suffering because it, its income from Eastern Europe had dried up. Um, and that these Jews began to make new connections um, with um, Messianic Christians in Europe. I'm not going to go into all the details. Um, it caused an enormous uh, stir in Jerusalem. And at the center of that stir, you know, that, that, uh, the, the concern about the connection with the non-Jews in, in Europe was the Rabbi Yaakov Hagiz and his star pupil, um, Nathan, who becomes known later as Nathan of Gaza. And so Nathan of Gaza is a child of 1648. He's brought up in the post-1648 world. And so when he starts to work on Shabbatai Tzvi, he knows, he can see. His father actually was one of these emissaries that traveled around. He was able to grasp the importance of that network and bring it into play for Sabathianism. Um, and so you have, it works both ways. It works at the beginning because the, the, um, the events and their consequences were indeed trans-regional, I mean, enormously trans-regional. And on the, other, on the other hand, the network that was sort of galvanized to deal with it was, the, was that which Nathan, Nathan and Hannah, Nathan and Hannah, Nathan of Gaza, I've got so many Nathans in this book, if you mind, Nathan of Gaza used uh, in order to, to help the Sabathian movement become the movement that it came. Um, and I think that is not a vision that has been seen before. People are very interested in the theology of Shabbat for very, very good reasons. But there's a, there's a huge social, uh, economic um, history that needs to be told. And um, I didn't tell it, but at least I, I'm able to say that I know it should be told. So it's always the first step. Uh, well, you mainly answered the following question, which, uh, which was asked by Glenn. Uh, can you address the link to Sabbatianism assumed by Zinger? So maybe you want to add the, you know, the Zinger's, uh, Bashevis oh. Zinger's uh, take on that. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, don't, I think... Uh, I'm happy to talk to Glenn about this privately. I, I think it'll be more confusing than it will be enlightening at this stage. But we definitely have covered Sabbatianism uh, sufficiently, so I'm, I'm happy as an audience. Uh, next question. Uh, are there any first person records of the time period written by one of the women who were captured? Or uh, are the extant records all written by men uh, of the time? I have very few first hand records written by women. Uh, in, in one of the major sadnesses of the text. What I do have are depositions in rabbinic courts, because this question of agunot, of, of wives who um, um, need to prove that their husband is dead, and, and they go to court and they bring depositions and they will tell their story to the court. Those are what I have. They're not literary compositions. They're not entirely, they're, de they're depositions in courts. And you do hear a certain amount of the woman's voice from there. Um, but it, it is a, well, it's a major drawback in all kinds of history, right? And the further back you go, the more difficult it is to hear the woman's voice. Um, and you're very often reading against the grain in order to get to women's experience, which is key. You can't understand this is, I mean, violence and flight are also gendered experiences. And if you don't work that out, then you can't really understand what's happening. I mean, women played key roles um, amongst the refugees in terms of um, they, they, could, they would help with the income. They played key roles with, amongst the people who helped them because they were the ones who would give the immediate aid 
to refugees as they came in. Um, so women are playing you know, all kinds of different roles in this, as I say, but without hearing their voices. I guess I had forgotten the most famous Ashkenazi Jewish woman, which is Glickel of Hamlin. And she has a very, very short text um, because to, to Altona, where she lived, a, a boatload of uh, Jewish refugees from Vilnius came, some of whom were sick. They, she, her father put them up in his house in the attic um, where the women, uh, Glickel, her sister, her mother, her grandmother, looked after them. Unfortunately, they were sick. And so Glickel got sick, but in fact, her grandmother uh, got sick and died. Um, so that is a first-hand account. And that actually opens our understanding of women as givers of aid and bravely doing it for that matter. I mean, you know, uh, you know in difficult circumstances. There is one, the best women's source I have is to do with the question of what's happening in the land of Israel. Remember I talked about women being proactive in, in trying to deal with their situation. Well, in the land of Israel, when the money dried up, um, there was no, the, the male treasurers of the community did not give the aid money to the women. It had other issues it had to deal with, serious issues. Um, but in fact, there was an outbreak of starvation. 400 women died. Um, and they were really upset that there was money, you know, whatever money was coming in wasn't coming to them. And so they did something unheard of before and again, actually since, sadly, um, at least till the you know, modern period. They organized together. They hired an emissary, called Shmuel Levy of Frankfurt. They gave him a letter and sent him to the Ashkenazi world and said, you talk to the women. This is a letter in Yiddish from women to women. You tell them to donate money to us and to write on the donation that it is for the women of Jerusalem, right? So that if, when it gets sent, the men aren't gonna put their hands on it and take it away from us. Um, it's not, that's not, that's only, it's indirectly connected with the, the topic of the book, but it, I think it's directly relevant to this question of women were not passive agents, women were active agents. And we have to look for their agency. Sadly, the idea of creating a, a woman's philanthropic network, right, from Ashkenaz to the land of Israel, didn't come to anything. It's a huge step to take in an early modern patriarchal society. But the fact that they just considered it and acted towards it, I think, is remarkable in and of itself. And we have the letter that they wrote, because Shmuel Halevi was sensible enough that it printed. And so one copy has survived. So we know what they actually wrote, what the women of Jerusalem wrote, to the women of Germany. Fascinating. We are staying in the, in the questions of women. Um, can you speak more about the experiences of women as slaves? In a word, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I hate saying no. That, okay. The women's experience enslaving that I can talk about. As slaves, that's more difficult. Um, young, beautiful women got the best prices on the slave market. And so they were the ones who were targeted by the Tatars in Ukraine. I mean, they took men as well. You take young men because young men can also work um, uh, you know, and have a value. But it's the women who have the value. I have a, a wonderful source one of these depositions written by, um, actually by a man who says um, they wanted to break up his family. They were taking his mother and sister away and they were going to leave him behind. And he says, well, I was lucky because I, my beard hadn't come in yet. I was a young boy and my beard hadn't come in yet. So they put a dress on me and I could go with my mother. But that, they put the dress in so he could go with his mother to, to, into slavery and not be left on his own in the hands of the... But once again, it talks about the the question of gender. These women were targeted. And when they got to Istanbul, what they were being sold into was uh, basically domestic slavery. They would be working as servants in houses. But of course, that was very often just a nice name for sexual slavery. Right? But they would be bought to serve the master of the house uh, in sexual terms. And so, you know, there are all kinds of hidden dangers for women 
um, in that process. Like I said, I don't have enough women's voices that I could say. I would love, I would so love to be able to talk a little bit about the women's experience of being sold, being bought, being ransomed. What I do have is a, something written by a man. It's a story. It's a kind of very short narrative story in Yiddish. Um, and it tells of a group of refugees who flee from Poland on foot to Turkey. Um, then they get captured and then they get sent to Istanbul and uh, there they are ransomed by the community. And th this is a, it's a beautiful little narrative which tells the story in some detail, but it's clearly written by a man and not by a woman. Um, and, um, but at least women are the, her the, her the heroes of the story, the women are at the center of that story, which once again goes back to this question of Yiddish sources as being a very good way of at least getting a finger hold into women's experience. Uh, what was the function of this narrative? Uh, was it some kind of a pamphlet? Uh, where did yeah. you where did you yeah. find it? Uh, well, I found it in, uh, in the Oppenheim collection in the Bodleian Library in Oxford in England, um, because um, Oppenheim collected all kinds of stuff. Right, this was what they call a chat book. It was a very simple text that was written up and sold so people could read it for entertainment. It's, you know, it's a very small thing. I mean, I, I only saw it scanned, obviously. I didn't see the original, but it's very small, only a few pages. Uh, it doesn't have a proper title page even. Um, but it, it's a story that people can read and be uplifted by. And I think particularly women. Women were an important part of the market for Yiddish books. So those were the books that women could read. Um, and so, um, as I say, that, that is what that story is. It's, it's a uplifting moral tale right about these women who saved themselves and their children um i haven't quite told the story right but it's too complicated to go into um it's an uplifting tale for women and for men next question um there were many jewish communities in the 18th and 20th and 19th centuries in poland lithuania galicia and other areas uh, can, uh, can you, what can we tell about the coalescence of these communities and uh, where the people came from? That's 18th and 19th centuries. Yes. Ago. Okay. Um, that's, that is um, the history of Polish Jewry. That's a really, <laughs> that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, Polish Jewry had a long history going back to the Middle Ages. It really took off in the 16th century. Um, it hit this major crisis in the mid 17th century, but managed to overcome it. Following that, we see um, that the Jews are positioned economically to work with the nobility more and more. And the nobility found new towns because they want to make money from them and they bring Jews in as townspeople. And so there is this kind of expansion of Jewish settlement particularly in the eastern regions of Poland and in Lithuania in the 18th um, and into the 19th century. Um, but these, I mean, in this period, they are really mostly Polish Jews. You're not seeing much migration from west to east. The migration from west to east is basically medieval. It continues, I mean, one historian said it continues up to 1648. And in 1648, the direction changed. Instead of having migration from west to east, after 1648, all of the migration is from east to west. It's overstated, but there is a shift, and you can many, many more Polish Jews are going to Germany, and then later on they go, you know, in the 19th century and 20th century, they go much further afield, much further west. Um, so they are creating German Jewry. What's happening in, in Eastern Europe is an internal thing, it's internal development. And part of the outcome of Polish Jews doing so well, both before 1648 and after 1648, is they have a demographic boom. Their numbers grow dramatically. And so they have a surplus population that needs to be settled. And they, that's the population that settles these towns. Wow, I managed to squeeze that in. Uh, the future generation of the refugees remember what had happened to their families? Was the history passed on? Oh, yes. 
they had the day, you had the day, the fast day, the 20th of Sivan, which was kept, um, I don't exactly know when, it was remembered right until the Holocaust. And in fact, in Eastern Europe, 1648 was viewed as a kind of Holocaust. And it was only the Holocaust of the 1940s that overshadowed it and sort of removed it from memory. So it was remembered. Um, the, the chronicles that were written, we mentioned Nathan Hannah's chronicle, but there are other chronicles that were written, were read regularly, particularly right, around the 20th of Sivan. I mean, the liturgy was recited. What we see in the 19th century, though, is when you have the beginnings of Jewish literature, um, 1648, and what happened is the motif that comes up time after time after time. Um, and so, yes, indeed, the, the, that memory is alive, is alive and well and expressed in different ways over the, over the period. Uh, can you comment on those Polish Jews who migrated to Amsterdam? I'm thinking about how the wealthy Sephardim reacted to the so-called beggar Jews, even while helping them. Did those Polish Jews go back to Poland or settle in Amsterdam? Uh, where they might uh, have been exposed to the rich art, music, writing of the golden era there? Uh, certainly Polish Jews went to Amsterdam. And certainly, I don't know who the question is, he's absolutely right that there's a lot of tension around the arrival of so-called beggar Jews. Um, what, we, what we know is that on at least some occasions you had these shiploads of Jews coming to Amsterdam and the Amsterdam community, the Sephardi community, the wealthy community organized and simply put them on a, on a, on a ship going up the Rhine and sent them away. They gave them money, didn't, so just send them away. They gave them money and said, well, you can't stay here, off you go. They sent them up towards, I don't know, Mainz or Frankfurt or wherever. Um, but about, I think between 500 and 1,000 Polish Jews did settle in Amsterdam. Um, and created their own community. Yeah, this interesting triangle in Amsterdam, you have the Sephardic Jews, you have German Jews, who actually were refugees from the Thirty Years' War, and you have Polish Jews, who were refugees from the wars in Eastern Europe. And there's a lot of tension between those three groups. Um, the, the German Jews and the Polish Jews don't get don't hit it off at all. They're not... Uh, the German Jews and the Sephardi Jews don't hit it off either. So the Sephardi Jews make a deal with the Polish Jews against the German Jews. Right? And then later on, the German Jews, I mean, it gets more complicated. It's a story that rolls on and on. Um, were the Ashkenazi Jews deeply influenced by the artistic um, cultural movements of 17th century Amsterdam? I'm doubtful. I mean, there's always a certain amount of osmosis. Um, but refugee communities are, it, it, it isn't how neither Ashkenazi communities in general nor refugee Jews communities in particular don't really work like that. So they would have been in it, but not of it. And being in it is, is not unimportant anyway. Um, thank you very much, Adam. That's Francesca Bragoli. Uh, I would like to hear more about the gender issue. Uh, okay. Mediterranean captives tended to be male. Uh, but as you said, many Ashkenazi refugees were women. Did Jewish communities try uh, to re trying to rescue and save refugees devise ways to deal with the fact that so many women were dispersed, aside from the issue of Agunot? That's a great question. That's a wonderful question. And that's all I can say about it. <laughs> I don't have any, I have really, you know, I just, I, I just don't know enough to be able to answer it. And it's very frustrating. And in particular on women's issues, it is so frustrating. Um, but I really don't, I really, I'm trying to rack my brains to think of any, any source I had that will talk about differential ransoming or differential treatment of refugees. No, that's very difficult. Um, one thing I, okay, so the only thing I can say, so I talked about that story, remember the story of the Yiddish of the, of the women refugees who end up in Amsterdam, end up in Istanbul. 
But at the end of that story, the writer says, um, how did we, you know, we had to find out amongst the, well, the, 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 the Istanbul Jews had to find out amongst all the refugees who were the Jews. Um, and so he said, you had to know if they could recite Psalms, um, they could recite the Shema, um, or if they were good people. I'm paraphrasing. Um, and those, you know, being good people is obviously um, just uh, words. Um, it's very hard to prove you're a good person or prove you're not a good person. Um, what I found interesting in that text, in a story that was all about women, was that the identification was done for men. Knowing Psalms and, and reciting the prayers, those are things that men did. For women, you might have said if they knew the brachot over the Shabbat candles or some other sort of female identifier. And that doesn't appear there which suggests to me that like so many, in so many other cases, the women are just not treated as important as the men. The effort is made for the men and the women, and they're not left behind and I'm sure they're ransomed and saved. But it's just not that important. It's not that worth paying attention to. Um, I, I'm sorry that I can't say any more than that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, in the era that you discuss, uh, were there deliberate efforts to preserve these stories for the future, other than in liturgy and former rituals, in the same ways as we see during World War II? Okay. What we do have, we have chronicles. So five or six men um, wrote texts in Hebrew telling the story of 1648 and clearly memorializing it. There is one Yiddish poem, I call it a historical song, that deals with it as well, which is for the much, for the slightly broader audience. I did see uh, somebody found in a Geniza in Germany, two pages from a, another Yiddish chronicle about Tachvatat, which is unknown. But unfortunately there was only two pages and it's hard to do much with it and anyway someone else was working on it so um so there must have been other texts that were written and haven't survived particularly in yiddish what is telling i think is, the, is these autobiographical vignettes that appear in so many of the rabbinic texts now i know rabbinic texts are written by men for men and by rich men for other rich men because who else is educated in hebrew but they are full of these personal stories and these personal stories are being written down decades after they happened. These were stories that were told orally on memorial days and kept from generation to generation. Jacob Emden, the 18th century rabbi in his autobiography begins with his great, great grandfather's experience as um, first of all, uh, 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 um, a victim and then a refugee of the violence. So that story had been handed down in his family for um, 100, 100 years at least. So my guess is the stories are being told orally um, and they stay within families and families think back to that experience. And our final question is: Was there uh, was the West, uh, was the network? Sorry, was the network for raising money to redeem Jews related to business networks? Um, not really. I mean, clearly, rich Jews are in contact with rich Jews, and you use those business networks. But these are networks that are made by two, at least they're they're sort of curated by two or three rabbinic figures in Venice. Venice is the hub of that. And they are making the connections with the communities, often with wealthy Jews in those communities, uh, but also with rabbis in communities. Um, and so they would be alongside, but not, not the same as. The question of Pidyon women actually though has a business, has a business aspect to it. Uh, at least one scholar has argued that the importance of rescuing Jews from pirates um, in, the, in the early modern Mediterranean and the amount of money that Jews were prepared to invest in this actually functioned as a kind of maritime insurance. You knew that if you were going to do business and you were going on a ship, uh, that some, you know, and then things went really badly, somebody would, you know, you'd be ransomed and you could be saved. Um, 
it's an interesting argument that it can't be proved one way or the other. Um, but that's, I think, the strongest business connection. Mm. Fascinating. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was our last question for today. This was a, a wonderful discussion. Uh, as a host, I need to make two announcements. Uh, one is that uh, I hope that all the attendees uh, know, and I'm just reminding it, that if you would like to, to get the book, uh, you can, thanks to the generosity of Princeton uh, University Press, you can get it as a special price using the special code. Uh, so please do that. Um, special code is on your website. Yes. Uh, and uh, the second uh, announcement is that within a week we will be able to post the, um, this program uh, on our YouTube channel and uh, I will make sure that you will all receive an email for that. And finally, uh, as you know, this was, uh, this was a program that was a free program. If you would like to support the Center for Jewish History in these dark times and in the better times to come as well. Uh, you can donate uh, by going to our website and just pressing the button. This is how, how easy it is. We would be very grateful for that and more able to uh, continue organizing uh, fascinating and inspiring uh, meetings like the ones uh, that, like the one that we witnessed today. Uh, thank you again very much. Uh, I guess I should wish you good summer, whatever that summer will mean for us this year. Uh, and I hope to see you and to see our participants uh, in person at the Center for Jewish History in the fall semester. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, Malcolm.